So what I hear you saying is, if this is a problem you have, call Dave and Matt offline. Yep. Because almost nobody has this problem. That is correct. Okay. It's it's a really interesting tax planning strategy. It's also the front door into the back door Roth IRA strategy. Okay. So that that was funny. The the front door to the back door Roth IRA. That was a little bit of a financial advisor kind of almost joke. A little. Yeah. 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 Because we're hilarious as financial advisors. So there you go. All right, gang, it's that time of the week. It's the best Tuesday you've had all week, and this is the True Wealth Radio Show. And uh, we're excited to have you here today. Uh, let me give you the rundown. It's not just me, your host, Dave Littlejohn, in studio today. I've also got with well, me... Matt Dixon and someone special. Derek Simmons, your yeah. favorite attorney. Uh, so he is. is our favorite attorney joining us today. Um, as you guys know, we have Derek on often. Uh, usually, it is to talk about a combination of Kansas and Carolina basketball. And I think that's a reasonable topic. We've only got an hour today, so I'm going to try to be brief. Okay. Kansas was preseason number one and then flamed out in the round of 32 this year. Right. Mm. And that was disappointing. So now they're preseason number one again for next year. Which just makes me question what preseason number one means. Nothing. (laughs) That and $6 will get you coffee at Starbucks. Very well. Yeah, I was going to say Carolina went in as a number one seed and flamed out in, I think, the round of 16. So, uh, nonetheless, uh, they were out. uh, And you know what? The Ducks made it farther than I expected. So, there you go. The Beavers were not in. So, although the ladies did real well. And I think they were, what, final four? So, Hmm. Or close to it, lead eight. They did great. So, um, anyhow, look, today we're going to talk about all kinds of stuff because that's what we do. Uh, some of it will be relevant to you, and some of it you wish will be relevant to you, right? Why? Because we want to talk a little bit about what happens when you inherit stuff. And the first, the first task there is pick your parents carefully. <laughs> yes, that is very helpful. Yes, this is sort of like uh, Derek and I have done uh, estate planning. Uh, like like seminars together before one of my favorites you're going to get this from derek on occasion will be things like hey if you don't want to ever have to have a will or a trust document what's one of the things you could do remind me just be immortal that's true right. immortality right. prevents the need for right. a will the or other a trust. is if you hate your family <laughs> right so those are two of my favorites if you hate your family or you're immortal then by all means you could skip the planning it works well so uh or if there are just no assets that actually is one of them, but that one was not so funny. <laughs> the, the immortal one really caught me. I remember he said that the first time, and I just went, how am I supposed to follow that? <laughs> so. Well, and, uh, you know, a lot of people feel immortal for a certain period of their life. Yeah. They're like, yeah, yeah there's no risk I'm going to die. No risk. And then they hit about 45, and their back creaks at them, and then they go, all right, there's a possible possibility that right. I could die. And then the hill, as I say, gets steeper. Yes. So... Uh, well, th- today we're going to talk about the other side of this, right? We've often had times when we have had uh, conversations about estate planning, okay? Because I like to take advantage when I've got Derek in studio because he's a wealth of knowledge on this stuff. But today I want to talk about the other side of it. What happens if you're getting stuff? Now, we've teased about lottery winnings before. It's there's some things in common, but believe it or not, inheritance, a lot of you out there listening are either looking at how you might pass an inheritance on, but several or many people listening might get an inheritance. And so the question is, well, then what? Okay. And one of the, what's one of the things that is similar to uh, between receiving an inheritance or winning the lottery? Free money. It's free money. Yep. Money that's free. Is that all of a sudden people will, it's, it's like a new resource in their life. So what do you do with it? Spend it, right? And it can be gone in a hurry. No, but what compounds things in an inheritance environment is that there are certain things that you may inherit that you could really increase the tax bill dramatically on, but with a little bit of planning, you may save yourself a ton in taxes, right? So uh, I don't think we have to spend the whole show on this, by the way, but I think it's relevant because if you're out there thinking, okay, what's, so let's, let's, let me ask first the question of what are some things that people inherit? You could inherit a parent's IRA, so a retirement account. That's a hard one, though. Let's start with the easy stuff. I agree. What's an easy thing to inherit? A bank account. Bank account. Piece of cake. Yes. 
and you have to go through probate to get it if you have a will or no will. Right. But you just, it ends up being money. Yeah. Now, what's one very low cost thing you could do with a bank account that would help to mitigate or avoid probate? You could, if you knew who you wanted to leave the money to, you could add them as a pay on death payee. Correct. So oftentimes known as a transfer on death or a TOD. And that, that way, they don't have any, whoever you're leaving the money to does not have any control over it until you actually die. But then it's theirs without going through probate. Derek, would you say that the probate process has changed much over the last five to 10 years? I, I don't know that the process itself has changed much. I know that it's gotten really more expensive. I've yeah. heard that. Now, yeah. I, don't, I don't handle probates myself, but I'm hearing that probate can cost eight to $10,000 for one where people aren't fighting. Right. And this is in wow. the state of Oregon, primarily the, what we're talking about when we're talking about probate. So depending on where you're listening or watching this thing, it could, you know, your mileage may vary wherever you're at. But yeah. It, it, and why is this so important? Well, I mean, if you're looking at the heirs, the people who are going to inherit things, if the cost of the trust is maybe, you know, less than that $10,000 mark in a probate it, court. It might make sense to pay some to avoid probate. Right. Exactly. Right. This is where we, yeah, we we, we caught Matt on that one, right? Because he, he just dropped an Easter egg into his comment if you were paying attention, which is you could get a trust, which is a form of pre-planning that's designed to avoid probate, right? And it used to be that people think, oh, trusts, they're so expensive. Why don't I just have a will and then go into probate? But it may actually be cheaper to do a trust now with the rising cost of probate. Yeah, the mm -hmm. one the one good thing about probate is they charge you after you're dead. True, but if you're you don't have to pay up yeah, front. You don't have to. But if you're if you're worried about how much your your heirs are going to inherit, then uh it's going to come out of their pocket. So then it's come out either while you're alive or it comes out after you're dead and then you kind of want the lower number at that point. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And of course, since this was not supposed to be the probate show. It okay? wasn't. We're talking right. about inheritance. Right. So we did we did bank accounts. Bank accounts. What are some other things that you could inherit that car, and, truck, a vehicle? Okay, sort. vehicles. All right. So what happens if you inherit a vehicle? Well, there is you a get an oil change. Or wait, that's not what we meant. Yes, you do you you have to get your name on the title. And that, and that is a probate thing. <laughs> well, it can be. It can be. And I um, I have not seen that the DMV in Oregon requires you to go through probate every time. Lots of times they'll accept alternate mechanisms gotcha. of proof so that you're the right a person. certificate but, or something similar. Yeah. So that's a possibility. Yeah. The issue is if the chain of custody is confusing, right? If you may have a vehicle. Let's say you're married, right? You have a vehicle in one person's name. DMV may be more inclined to allow the spouse that was obvious to right. take title. But if it's a next generation, now there's a, a it's a, it's more ambiguous what the chain of custody. Then they, they may want to see a will, even if it's not probated. Right. And we're not speaking for the DMV, by the way. And again, your mileage may vary and your DMV may vary. I don't even know. So should it? So that's should. that's vehicle. A uh, third one might be real estate. Real estate, so another titled asset. Real estate is either going to go through probate to change the title from the dead person's name to the people who are inheriting his name, or it could use a transfer on death um, mechanism to pass without going through probate, but it does make it a little bit hard to sell the property for about 18 months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so then, but, but that's what you usually do is the kids who inherit or whoever's going to inherit has a choice. I'm either going to live in it or I'm gonna sell it, one or the other. And so what what the inheritor intends to do with it makes a difference on what the owner does in the first place. Okay, so we've covered real estate. We've covered personal property items, right? Things, well, I guess that's really more like things with title, vehicles we've talked about. Right. So what about personal property? Things that don't have title associated. Yeah, so those are technically supposed to go through probate. Exactly. And yet, and yet they often don't. Yeah, it's it's one of those things that uh, it's kind of hard to account for sometimes. And it's one of the big challenges in a, especially in a contested environment is, well, what happens when something just walks away in the process? How do you prove probate? Where it went. 
that that can be uh, that can be one of those things people fight about. Yeah, I can remember a story of family members, and they said, "Well, what happened to the tractor?" Right, that sort of disappeared from the premise. Of course, tractors have titles associated with them, so that ultimately, uh, you know, found its way to resolution, and it was awkward because you can't just leave and say, "I have no idea what happened to it." Well, that's funny because trying to register that thing, we discovered it's uh, in your garage. <laughs> right, right. So who knew, right? Uh, so here's, I think, Matt, you asked one of the tricky ones right out of the gate. Okay. Yeah, and I had to do a lot of talking up front because I don't know the answer to what happens to an IRA. Right. Well, the good news is we do. But the first question I would ask Matt is, what kind of IRA? Right. I mean, first of all, how many types of IRAs are there? There are so many. You have your traditional IRA, your Roth IRA, your simple IRA, your SEP IRA. There's a lot of different types of IRAs. Yep. Yeah. And, and then there's a lot of things that walk and talk like IRAs, but they're not actually IRAs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there are some things that they all have in common, right? Right. And so I think it's probably worth us talking about some of the things they all have in common and then what are some of the differences are. Well, the easy one is beneficiaries. They do all have beneficiaries, okay? Which you're, you can be a beneficiary to a will. Of course, True. there's beneficiary pathway through probate. Mm -hmm. You could be a beneficiary in a trust. That should be a pathway without probate. Or you could be a beneficiary in a retirement plan. What the heck does that mean? Mm -hmm. As I understand it, this is money that can't come to me all at once. Or maybe it could, well, but it sucks. Yeah, so it can, but the question is, is that the smart move? So first, let's paint the picture. There's two big buckets of IRA money, right? This is an example. Yeah, yeah. so you have Roth IRA money or traditional tax-deferred type IRA money. Now, that, that tax-deferred so two bucket, IRAs, traditional they're, they're, IRA, They're different IRA. pathways, mm -hmm. right? Let's think of it simply as, there, there's a third hybrid, it's the most obnoxious one, but let's understand Roth and traditional first, okay? A traditional IRA, and this is going to be a, like most of your employee-er-sponsored retirement plans. The stuff you haven't paid taxes. No yet. taxes yeah. have come out. Yeah, you, you earn the money, and before it's taxed, we pull it out, put it into an investment, and it is allowed to grow tax-deferred. And then in the future, you take the money out. And when you take it out, you pay the taxes as income in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other basket is the Roth basket, which is you earn money, you pay the taxes. And then with what's left after you've already paid your taxes, you invest it and then it grows tax deferred. And if you qualify, and we've done other shows about this, right? There's the five-year rule and some, you know, really kind of weird stuff around it. But basically, assuming the Roth is sort of the switch is turned on and it's acting like a real Roth with no gotchas. So after five years, most of the time. Then when you take the money out after full retirement age, another important caveat, tax-free, right? You paid all the taxes up front, so no taxes on the, on the back end. The other one, you don't pay the taxes up front, so you get taxed on the back end. And those are the two big baskets. Now, there's a third one that throws everybody off. Is this a smaller basket or multicolored or what? So, yes. Okay. Smaller, multicolored. Uh, it's kind of the way annuities work. Okay. This is the scenario where you make too much money to deduct an IRA contribution. So, you make an after-tax traditional IRA contribution, and then it grows tax deferred. And when it comes out, some of the money was taxed and some wasn't. And you actually have to track it to tell the IRS so that you can keep track of how much tax you have to pay on that. So what end. I hear you saying is, if this is a problem you have, call Dave and Matt offline yep. because almost nobody has this problem. That is correct. Okay. And it's, it's a really interesting tax planning strategy. It's also the front door into the back door Roth IRA strategy. Okay. So why are you that, was, that was funny. The, the front door to the back door. Right yeah. there, right? That was a little bit of a financial advisor kind of almost joke a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Cause we're hilarious yeah. as financial advisors. Yeah, so there yeah. you go. Yeah. Uh, all right. The traditional IRA, this is going to be a lot like your 401ks. It's going to be a lot like a 403b if you're in the, the uh, 
like uh, public sector or you know even like the IAP program for PERS, any of these. You haven't been taxed on the money yet. So somebody has it, they're in retirement, they're, they're pulling it out, paying taxes as they go, and they croak. It's a technical term. Right. And now, Dave, you inherit this IRA. Right. Mm-hmm. So first of all, I'm, I'm curious how I knew them. Right. right. Yeah. There's, and why does that matter? Because if you're a spouse, then you've got different options than if you're not. Mm. Right. Why does this matter? Like, first of all, a lot of people may be thinking, oh, yeah, do I have that rich uncle in Zimbabwe that's finally going to come through? Right. Or if you're married and, you're, and you lose your spouse and they had a retirement plan in their name. Well, you're going to get some options. One of them is you can leave the money in their name and carry on until uh, uh, the other is you can roll the money over into your own name. There's pros and cons based on your age, right? As to why you would do one or the other. And again, I'm not going to go super deep on the radio on this. I'm going to tell you, this is where if you don't understand the nuances, find a tax advisor or financial planner that can help you with this, Mm -hmm. right? And if you don't know one, Matt will shamelessly give you our phone number. Yep, 541-375-0898. Or you can even go to our website at littlejohnfs.com. Right, because everybody's circumstances, you know, yes, you nailed that, thank you. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So, but that's the, between spouses, you get some options because the law allows you an unlimited transfer of assets between spouses without a tax effect which is nice, but what if it's not your spouse? Say it's a kid, it's, you know, somebody else that you, you know, but it's a person, right? If you give it to a charity, we don't worry about that. Okay, that's great. They're gonna take the money and if the charity doesn't pay taxes, they're not paying taxes on what they get. But let's say you're, you've got a, a kid that's gonna inherit this. What are their options when they inherit well, under current tax rules? You could open something called a beneficiary IRA and then transfer those funds into the beneficiary IRA. That is correct. That's one option. Mm -hmm. So let's start with what's probably the less than ideal option typically. Pull all the money out. There was $500,000 in there. You pulled it all out because you wanted to go on a spending bender. Yeah, and Matt, that was really going to help my Walmart trip, man. The, yeah, I know. Anything you, else is going to be less happy for right, my Walmart trip. So why are you going to pull a Shaquille O'Neal and go to Walmart and drop $600,000? So so you're going to just, you're going to inherit a big chunk of money. And why do I say big? Because if you're going to inherit 500 bucks, it's probably not that big a deal. Right. If you're going to inherit 500 thousand mm-hmm. or more even right if you took what that, happens if you just cash the thing out and put it in your checking well, if account? you pulled that I money mean, out of a traditional ira that's now five hundred thousand dollars of income for and, the year and you're going to hit the highest tax bracket mm-hmm. okay talk to me about this i mean obviously I'm, I'm leading the witness here but i just want you guys to explain to our listeners what do you mean okay well there's a graduated tax rate if i only make fifteen thousand dollars a year i'm not going to pay much taxes if I make five hundred thousand dollars a year, I am going to make a much pay a much higher percentage of those uh, of that, and I think I go from like the zero percent bracket to the twenty eight percent federal bracket. I think it's thirty seven, right? Holy yeah. smokes! Yeah, it's high. And then tack on another what nine ten percent, twelve maybe nine point eight percent in Oregon. I think at that level. Okay. Yeah. At least, I mean, don't quote me on this. Right. I pulled it off. It's a lot. Head. You could lose almost half of it, is what we're trying to say. Yep. Whereas if I string it, if I string it out for longer and don't take it all at once. Then it's smaller bite-sized chunks right. that keep me believe, below the thresholds. Yeah, I believe you have like 10 years to take that money out. Correct. This is the this is the key here. If you were to just take all the money at once out of as a beneficiary, just take a check, put it in your checking account. That's accepting all of the money at once. And the IRS says, Great, then all of the taxes that have been deferred showed up at the door with this inheritance. And you just said you're going to pay them all to me right now. So we're going to take all that money and apply it, the tax bracket to it right now, and it's going to drive your taxes way up. And that's one of the interesting things about retirement accounts versus anything else you're going to inherit. Anything else you're going to inherit, you're probably not going to get it until after the taxes have been paid. But an IRA is going to come with a a, a pre-tax IRA is going to come with a tax obligation attached to it. Right. This, incidentally, is also true for annuities. 
Okay. So an annuity has that similar issue is that the money that the tax that's been deferred, that deferral doesn't disappear when you die. It gets inherited by the heir. So that's the key. Now, remember, annuities, just like that weird hybrid, some of it was taxed and some of it wasn't, some money is usually after tax and some of it is pre-tax. So it's a mix of what you're going to be taxed on because some of it you already paid, the tax was already paid. Okay. So it just depends on how the, the, the accounts were structured. But the IRS looks at it pretty simply. They get you on the way in or they get you on the way out. And they only tax stuff that hasn't been taxed already. And let's not talk about C corps. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, in an IRA situation, if I'm going to inherit an IRA, is the general rule that I'm always going to want to string it out? So not necessarily, but if it's a big IRA, the general rule is that you'd probably want to string it out. And, and you may not need to string it out for 10 years. Okay. Right. That you have up to 10 years with which to determine when to take the distributions. This is a change, by the way, from years past. You used to have different circumstance, not worth discussing because that's not the rules anymore. But today, up to 10 years to make these withdrawals. So, yeah, I mean, while we're on the inheritance topic, do we want to talk about how gifting is kind of related to this whole piece? So, so because, we will, Yeah, but, but let's, I'd like for our listeners to kind of Let's finish up this, this is a concept, because I think this is an important one that everybody latches onto. If you're going to inherit this thing, you ask the question, Eric, you know, do you want to take it all at once, I think? Right. And the answer well, is, I, it depends. The thing I said was, don't we always want to string it out? Right. And, and then and, you said no. And I said, the answer is, it depends on Dollar your effective amount. tax rate, right? Mm -hmm. If it's a really big account, you probably want to stretch it out, because... You know, you don't necessarily want to give way more away in taxes unless there's a really good reason. Like you just have to, you know, get a hold of to purchase something well, else. If so, yeah. if I'm in a really high tax bracket today, right now, but I know mm -hmm. that I'm going to retire in a year or two, I might wait till I have low income earning years and then I might pull a bunch of it out. Yeah. You, you, and the idea is you're, I use this term a lot, right? You want to bully your tax rate. Mm -hmm. Okay. And bullying your tax rate is kind of like, yeah, you're going to push it around, right? Huh? You, what did you, you want a piece of this? No, no. What I'm going to do is I'm going to push you into the lowest tax environment I can. So I'm going to shift it around into different years, mm -hmm. or I'm going to try to shift it into different types of assets. So we'll change the way it gets taxed if possible. So that's the idea when you're planning, when you're trying to be tax aware is to, try to find the areas where your tax exposure is going to be lower. And if you can't make it lower, then you spread it out so that you're not driving it even higher. Because the way progressive tax codes work, the last dollar in is the most expensive to be taxed, right? We didn't talk about effective tax rate initially. We talked about highest tax rate, okay? So once you, you know, if you, the, if you have half a million dollars, you're, you finish in the highest tax bracket, but you didn't start in the highest. So your your blended rate, rate is less than your maximum rate. But for each additional dollar you take in that maximum bracket, you're moving your blended rate higher, mm -hmm. right? Because it's a more expensive tax for each additional dollar that you withdraw. So that's why we tend to stretch this stuff out. So big account, stretch it out, unless you can see into the future and you know that the tax rates are going to double next Correct. year. Yes, if you're clairvoyant, you should make really good decisions. You really, yeah, you already know the answer. We don't even have to tell you. You know the answer. Yes. So in fact, if you know the answer, because you can predict the future, please call us. <laughs> Wait, if you really think you know the answer, maybe you shouldn't call us. <laughs> <laughs> so Roth IRAs, as a reminder, the taxes were paid before the money got put into the retirement account. Yep. And then it grows tax-free. And then when can you take the money out? Okay. So this is before you're dead, right? Yeah. So, so, so before I'm dead, when can I take it out? And then after I'm dead, when can my... Okay. So first, it has to satisfy the five-year rule. Okay. And that is tricky if you... where The only reason we really care about the five-year rule is if you have a Roth 401k and you're rolling money over. Because every time you make a rollover or every time you do a conversion of a traditional IRA to Roth, 
you get a new five-year window on that block of money. And the five-year window says, once I've existed for five years as a Roth, the, the later features, right? You have the now feature of tax deferral, but the later feature is tax-free. It activates the tax-free nature, which means once you are beyond age, currently 59 and a half is what we consider full retirement age. After age 59 and a half, if you satisfy the five-year rule, the Roth IRA distributions are tax-free. Okay, so that's for me. Yep. If I put money in a Roth, I can take it out after 59 and a half, assuming it's been in there for five years and I'm in good shape. Yeah. All right. Now, what about my children? Okay. The cool thing is if children inherit it, the same story is you got 10 years to take it out, but tax-free to heirs. So you could potentially still defer 10 more years of growth and allow that all to compound. And then, you know, we presume it will compound, but then at the end of 10 years, take it as a lump sum distribution and it's still tax-free. That's interesting. So if they take it out in year one after they inherited it and invest and reinvest it in something else, they're going to pay taxes on income from that. But if they leave it in there for 10 years, all the growth is tax deferred and they don't pay it till they take it out. So it makes great sense if they don't have a burning need for the money to leave it in there for the full 10 years. Absolutely. Interesting. Yep. The, The Roth is... Uh, we oftentimes talk behind the scenes. It's one of the most utilitarian tools in the financial planning tool bag. The Roth IRAs are just really cool. They're they're great because there's no required distributions, unlike traditional deferred accounts. So right now at age 73, oh, you haven't taken any money out. The IRS says it is time. You will take some out and pay taxes, or you will be penalized worse than the taxes. So they're really serious, right? Not so with the Roth IRA because there is no tax when it comes out. So they're in no hurry, right? And it that benefit transitions to heirs and they get that 10-year window as well. So it's a, it's a great tool. We encourage folks to try to have a basket because it's also great. Here's like something nobody thinks about, okay? Uh, one of the things that's really obnoxious is uh, getting sick and not dying, right? It's super expensive. And while when you start getting into Medicare years, if you've got the appropriate Medicare and supplements and everything else, you can have a lot of the, the medical components managed. The idea of needing some kind of continuum of care becomes more and more common. What am I really talking about here? Assisted living. Assisted living, long-term care event, right? Where you have a medically qualified long-term care event. Maybe it's not even medically qualified. Maybe you just need assisted living. And... You can buy long-term care insurance, where if you have certain qualifying events, it can be, you can use that. It's quite expensive, right? You can buy certain forms of life insurance with accelerated death benefit associated, which is a way to sort of claw death benefit into the now, if you have certain qualifying events and use that. That's kind of exotic. I think there's some similar annuities with features that have some riders that around distributions for uh, certain qualifying events. But what if you had simply a chunk of Roth IRA money that was available that could be pulled out, that wasn't taxable in the event that you needed it, and if you didn't use it, it went to your heirs and it became a flex fund for you in retirement. So you've designed a retirement income between Social Security pensions and other retirement plans, and this basket of Roth money is your flex pool. Mm. And that to me is the real story behind these things that we miss. Right? And I'm talking now about the person surviving rather than the person's inheriting. But if you inherit, it might suggest that that Roth is a really powerful tool and it can also enable you to continue funding your own Roth. And you know that long-term care spot is one of those, we joke about immortality. Right. But even folks who are getting to be in their 60s or 70s don't ever think about, well, actually... I do encounter some that think about it, but many people don't think about the possibility that they lose their ability to lose and to live independently Mm -hmm. without dying. Yeah, it's and it's the the triggering events are their own 
uh, scenario too. There's usually six activities of daily living, and I don't remember all of them. But there are things that you want to be able to do. You know, dress yourself, go to the bathroom on your own, feed yourself, change channels yeah. to watch Kansas basketball. Exactly. So it's critical. There are a number of those, and if you can't do those, then you would. Those are qualifying events. But think about like what, what do you do? if you need help. And so there's a lot of people that rely on family and other folks to, to do caregiving, but, uh, and some people do buy long-term care insurance. It's just become really cost prohibitive because insurance companies look at this and say, I have no idea how to price this thing because the cost of medical is escalating so radically that we can't really afford to stay in this business. So our Roth account, uh, Roth uh, IRA is our secret plan to pay for. It's, it's certainly part it. of the utility. I mean, when we talk to folks, Right it's not now. secret if you're going to tell people. It's about not. That. It's not. But the idea of hey, part of healthy and robust planning includes contingency planning, and that means, uh, in, in my opinion, the best way that you can handle potential long term care is self insurance. What do I mean? You mean having enough money that you don't need insurance? Exactly. Right. Like, why do you not typically need life insurance when you retire? Because you don't have any kids in the house that you got to worry about supporting. Yeah. What does life insurance do? Right. It, this is, it buys you peace of mind that everyone's going to be taken care of. And if everyone's gone and out of the house, who's left to take care of? Okay. That's true. Usually I, uh, I hear from people who buy term insurance because they want to cover a specific thing. Like if I die, I want my kid's college to be paid for. Right. I, I hear from other people who just buy insurance and are not thinking about it. And they keep paying it and they keep paying it. And then eventually yeah. we talk about what it's for. They don't have anything to here's it's for. Here's my take on what life insurance is for. It does one of two jobs, okay? And then there's a third one that is hinky, right? The first one is it replaces income that people anticipated you earning. You were supposed to earn income that was going to be able to pay for stuff. And but now you, you can't. croaked, yes. Right. And so we need to replace the income that was going to come in by ensuring that ability for you to earn the income. And that's the form of life insurance if you die and disability insurance if you don't die. So that's the two forms of insurance there. And life insurance is the one we talk about the most because it's the most permanent, typically, uh, or it's the most obvious, right? Uh, disability is one we don't often associate as frequently, but you know, if somebody dies, like that income is definitely not returning. And we've seen and all heard the stories of the hardship of somebody left behind without life insurance. I'm guessing the second one is going to be estate taxes. Exactly. So if I die with a bunch of real estate, I don't want my kids to have to sell it in order to pay the, uh, the state of Oregon uh, estate taxes. So that being the case, I would buy a policy that would spin off enough money to pay the taxes. And that way they can just inherit the property and not worry about the taxes. Right. And the third one which we are not going to go deep into because it's going to just uh, annoy me. Are you sure you want to tell them, Dave? <sighs> yes, I'm sure. Fine. Yeah, it is. Some There are certain scenarios when you can build up cash value in life insurance and use it as a funding mechanism for specific purchase items. Are you going to talk about whole life? Nope, okay. I'm not. I mean, that is a feature that comes with whole life or universal or even variable universal life. But there are just so many gotchas in it, and it's such a long-term commitment. And there are people out there that will sell it like this is a, a really amazing way to become your own bank and replace banks and all that. And my suggestion is that that is a pretty complex, really long-term commitment. And so while it can academically on paper work out, I rarely see scenarios where it plays out the way it's designed. Yeah. So I'm just very careful about saying, sure, that's a great solution. I think that's a super, super niche solution. And for most folks out there, uh, I, I struggle to think it's appropriate for their circumstance. So anyway, so there's the three, okay? Now, here's the question. What is the kind of stuff that you would most like to inherit? Gold bullion. Yes, so it's just pretty good. Or is or it because you just want to swim in a big pool? I did gold? read about Scrooge McDuck as a child, yeah. and I, I have to be candid. It had some appeal. Right. But I also would, I, I think small unmarked bills would be a fine thing to inherit. Just a lot of them. Yep. Mm -hmm. Turns out small unmarked I bills. Am, I am actually going to inherit small unmarked bills. Yes. Just yes. not very many of them. <laughs> so the interesting thing, like inheriting cash tends to be pretty good. 
Right. Right. Because there's no tax associated with Unless it. Unless you want to go buy like a five hundred thousand dollar house with cash that's unaccounted for, and then every and like, red flag, red flag. Right. <laughs> so let's talk about as an heir. What are the things? You, so one of the things I hear a lot: common mistake. People will say, "Well, great. Now I'm going to inherit this thing, and I'm just going to have to pay taxes on it." Is that so? Well, no. It's going to be taxed before they inherit it. Right. And it depends on which tax we're talking about. I can only think of two taxes, really. Estate right. tax. Estate tax, which, right, that's the Pesky death tax depending Oregon. on the state. Mm -hmm. What's the other tax? Capital gains? Probably not. Probably. Because you're going to get a step up in basis. Correct. Probably it would be that IRA scenario we talked about earlier in the program. Oh, deferred it income. Was deferred income, and you'll have to pay deferred income tax. Otherwise, and you just said it, what do you mean by step up in basis? So if I buy property for $100 and then later on I sell it for $1,000, that's a capital gain. Right. And I get to deduct my basis from the gain, from the sale price. So now I'm paying tax on $900 of capital gain. But if I, if I buy something for $100, leave it to my children, die and leave it to my children, and the very next day they sell it for $1,000, then their ba my basis increases to the fair market value on the date of my death. So they pay zero taxes. All right. Let did me, I make that overcomplicated? Nope, nope. You actually did it real well. I'm just going to substitute one word for our listeners and see if this helps make sense. You are, your capital gain tax is on your profit. Yes. Okay. So if you bought for a hundred and sold for a thousand, you had 900 of profit and that's new money into your ecosystem. And the government says, we're going to tax you on your profit. And they divide the profit into one of two categories, short term or long term. Now, I'm not sure exactly why they do it, but here's an easy way for me to remember it. If you've owned something for less than a year, then they consider that you're, you're buying it and selling it again. Well, then that's your job. You're just flipping through these things. And so you got your day job. So they're going to tax it as so it looks like income. It's not an income tax because it was, in fact, a profit. But they're going to tax it that way. And they're going to call that a short-term capital gain because you held it for less than a year. Longer than a year, they're going to call it long-term capital gain. And they're going to change the tax rate on it. And it's going to become lower and more favorable. It's a really important thing to remember out there, by the way. But for people inheriting, your point is the profit basically gets erased because it's like getting a reset to the current value the day they inherit. That's correct. And this is one of the things that comes up in lots of estate planning discussions is parents will say, what if I just add my children onto the title of my property? Right. But the problem is, if you do that, it's a transferred basis. Yep. So now when you die and the kids are the owners, they still only have $100 in. And if they sell it the next day for 1000 they have $900 worth of profit. Yep. So you lose that sort of, I, I called it a racing profit. It's, I mean, it is effectively what it is, but it's that step up in basis. Right. Right. So typically when you inherit property, it, you'll get that step up in basis. Okay. And the same is true, by the way, side note for how life insurance works. Typically speaking, life insurance is going to be inherited tax-free, okay? When wouldn't it be tax-free? When wouldn't life insurance be tax-free? It's going to yep. be income tax-free. Right? It wouldn't be tax-free in the event that it was paid for with pre-tax money. Remember the weird thing where the IRS gets you on the way in or they get you on the way out? If in most, now health insurance is a different animal, but life insurance is what we're talking about. If you pay for life insurance with like, let's say you own a business and you say, oh, I'm going to buy insurance on key. myself yeah. and you and you pay for it and you write it off and then you die, the benefit now becomes taxable. So this is why we tell people never deduct life insurance payments in a business. If you're both the payer and the beneficiary, it doesn't work. Correct. Mm. So you don't want to have your death benefit sort of take, be like goofed up. That's a good one. So you pay for life insurance with after tax money. Okay. Now, all of this in the end of the day, if you were inheriting, there's a couple things to keep in mind, right? One, uh, hopefully th th there's emotions associated with this. I encourage everybody take your time making decisions. 
especially if you've gone through a really emotionally traumatic experience. You don't want to necessarily have your judgment clouded because of what's going on. So we need a one week waiting period before Matt goes to Walmart. <laughs> that, that, yeah. Well, you'll never find me in a Walmart, okay. but most of Douglas County you'll find there. <laughs> right. And so that's the first thing though, is just be slow and deliberate. If you are emotional, um, I would encourage you to find somebody else that can you can kind of run ideas by. This is where a financial professional can be really valuable. Uh, and then the other, I think is if you're going to inherit stuff, is you know take the time to, to to understand the tax ramifications before you make those decisions, right? So there's the emotional side, and then oftentimes we don't know what we don't know. So if you've heard this program, like I said, get the podcast, send it to a friend because uh, if if you've got heirs out there, you want to make sure that you navigate this cautiously. Uh, and on the last one, uh, look, if you're in the planning process uh, and you are trying to set this up so your heirs are in good shape, you can call Derek. Absolutely. 541-677-7185. Okay. And if you are in the process of inheriting and you would like some help navigating, uh, you can certainly call us. Yeah. 541-375-0898. Okay. Uh, us being you know, Matt and Dave. Uh, I will also tell you that we will offer a free consult on any of this stuff. Our goal is to just get you in the right spot. If it ends up that you're a good fit and we become uh, have a customer relationship together, awesome. But if, if not, that is okay. The purpose here, just like this program, we want to make sure we get you put in the right spot so that uh, things are working for you. And so uh, our, our goal is simple. If you walk in the door, we want you to leave in a better spot than you got there. And if that means you're working with us, wonderful. If not, we hope we're pointing you in the right direction. So that is all. But uh, I'm looking at the clock. Guys, can you believe it? We already blew through the, client, the time. <laughs> Wow. With that only one more reference for Kansas basketball. Only time for one. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's the music. We got to run. So until next time, I'm Dave Littlejohn. Matt Dixon. Derek Simmons. And you've been listening to True Wealth. Thanks for tuning in on News Radio 93.9 FM and 1240 KQEN.